I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue Is, Governor Gavin Newsom talks about his new book in perhaps his most personal interview yet. In an in-depth sit-down with us, the governor talks baseball about dyslexia and how learning differences have defined who he is and how he sees the world. We also talk about surging crime in the state. What can he do about it? And is it time for Prop 47 to go? And we talk about COVID. And I ask, when can our state of emergency end? Governor Newsom for the half hour, as the issue is, starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. This week, Governor Newsom traveled across the country and across the state promoting his new book about his own struggle with dyslexia. Here it is. It is called Ben and Emma's Big Hit. So this is a book about, it's kind of a book that's a little bit about me growing up. We were with the governor as he read it to an elementary school class in North Hollywood, one of many classrooms he visited this week. Afterwards, he sat down with us for a one-on-one -on -one interview. Governor Newsom, welcome back to The Issue Is, and congrats on the book. Finally got it out. I'm excited about it. Thank you. Uh, so th this issue of dyslexia, I think there's a lot of people that aren't dyslexic that yeah. don't really know what it is. <laughs> right. So when you look at a piece of paper yeah. and there's letters on it, yeah. what do you see? Describe your vision. It's interesting. I mean, it, it manifests very differently for different people. And anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of all of us around the world have some form of language-based learning disability. What's typically connected with dyslexia is a difficulty reading, which is certainly something I have, but also spelling and writing. And it manifests uh, at a relatively young age, and it could have devastating consequences unless you remediate, screen, test for it. And for me, uh, I was lucky enough to get support but it is a lifelong disability, and it includes now today my inability, even as governor, it's not an easy thing to say, but to read speeches as an example. Reading is still extraordinarily difficult, spelling impossible, but there's also all of these other wonderful things that we're promoting as well that make dyslexics actually do well in life. And when you say that about reading speeches, a lot of people that aren't with you all the time might not realize that you don't go up there with notes. There yeah. isn't a teleprompter. Yeah. You're doing everything either off the top of your head or trying to memorize it, yeah. right? And that's not because I want to do that. It's because yeah. I have to do that. And there are times when I try not to do that, they never go well, including, by the way, teleprompter speeches, which I do tend to do once a year, and I dread them. I'm spending 100 hours, by the way, I don't know that I'm wildly exaggerating, for a 45 minute speech in a teleprompter and I actually interestingly use a dyslexic font in the teleprompter, the same font that we used in the book. And that's what you did at Dodger Stadium, the state of the yeah. state address uh, last yeah, and year. And I dread that because it's so much easier to go up extemporaneously because the brain is wired that way. And that's, so it's a neurological issue. And it's an issue again, uh, that we're just starting to appreciate and understand more fully. And people are now destigmatizing. It's a big part of why I wrote this book. So we're in a classroom right now. We were just with you with a bunch of kids. Take us back young Gavin Newsom, you're in the class yeah. like those kids. What was that experience like for you? Dread every day, I mean, like actual dread. I, I remember, I mean, and this is not something to promote, it's embarrassing, but I remember faking being sick all the time just to get out of class. I remember sitting there, just desks, rows of desks, just my heart pounding, looking at the clock, just praying that I didn't have a teacher call on me. I was in the back of the classroom the entire time for years and years and years. Uh, I struggled. I, I fell back, went to five or, I think I was five or six different schools in my first, you know, 10, 11 years. Uh, but I got a lot of support along the way from a single mom that didn't give up on me and a couple teachers, Tina Lovetso, Mr. Ng, and a few others that really brought out what I needed most, which was developing some confidence because what dyslexic kids don't have is any self-esteem. They don't have confidence. They think they're stupid. They don't think they're smart. And intellectual capacity manifests differently and that's what we're discovering dyslexics don't lack intellectual capacity but they lack the ability to learn like others all right and you've pointed out people like pablo picasso steven spielberg robin williams all dyslexic yeah. in a lot of ways this book is a love letter to your mom yeah your late mom um, and you talk about baseball and how that impacted your yeah. life yeah 
And how did, was your mom connected to baseball impacting your she life? She just didn't give up on me, and she was an athlete. She was ambidextrous, she played tennis, she didn't have a backhand, uh, so she really got us involved in sports. She was, she was with two kids, divorced at a very early age, came from no wealth, uh, a family was a pretty broken up uh, family, but she had just passion and grit, hard work ethic, and she was never gonna give up. One kid that was struggling, one kid that was doing very well, my sister. Uh, but baseball was what got me out of my shell. Sports got me out of my shell, gave me confidence. And that confidence manifested on the baseball field around little league, minor leagues and uh, major leagues. But there was an incident I'll never forget, ever, growing up, where I struck out three times in a game. And you don't forget that as a kid. I was in right field. I was just learning my skills. And if you're in right field, you know what that means. For a lot of youngsters, it's where they less the ball goes there less often. Yeah, Mookie Betts pretty good though. Yeah, no, it becomes less significant. <laughs> okay. But boy, when you're yeah. younger, yeah. I'm not saying that's yeah. all the parents out yeah. there. Oh no, my kid's in right field. Yeah. But I was in right field for a reason, and I struck out, and I was done. Doing terrible in school. I can't read, can't write, I'm doing, still doing speech therapy. And I look back at all these reports about my speech therapy, I didn't even realize that I had a difficult time even communicating. But she went back out right after the game. Place was empty, Joe Wagner Field, Marin County, Twin Cities. She came up and she started throwing the ball to me. And she threw the ball just nonstop. And no, no BS, it's a true story. You can ask Maurice Bignum, he pitched the next game. I hit a damn home run, total lark, one in a million. Went 195 feet. Changed my life, like literally, man. I look at my life, forgive me, the vernacular. I look at my life at those magical moments and it was her connecting to that. That was like a moment, a pivot moment, a hinge moment where I just started to realize I can overcome stuff. But it was her willingness not to give up on me. So this is, you're right, this is, I wrote an actual letter, but it is a composite love letter to moms. Right. To those heartbroken parents that are struggling with kids with learning disabilities. You, you've said that in, in some ways you're still that kid, you're always that kid. Always, always will be. How does that work in a world of politics when you're surrounded by giant egos, a bunch of Ivy League people who are super arrogant, uh, a lot of people with a lot of money, a lot of people who are intellectuals who read a bunch of books and write a bunch of books, how does that work? Do you feel insecure yeah. in those rooms? How, do, how does that work? Always have. I have to work harder. Here's what I discovered. You're never going to outwork me. And that's because I, I wouldn't have done anything in my life if I didn't hustle and outwork. I'm willing to take risk. I'm, worried, I'm willing to make mistakes. I, I, there's an entrepreneurial mindset. I, I found the strengths of problem solving, reasoning, uh, to be able to paint outside the line, try things that other people wouldn't try. And I'm finding those are the real skills in a world where we're looking for something a little bit different. I think, so it defines, yeah, that anxiety and that insecurity, absolutely. I mean, people say, well, Yale, Harvard, Sanford, all this stuff. I'm like, it's, like, it's just, it's another world to me and it means, also means nothing to me. It means nothing to me. I'm an employer, like I started out of college, pen to paper, hired hundreds of people out of about a thousand employees a peak. I never looked at a resume if you went to Harvard or Stanford, it meant nothing. I want grit, I want hard work, I want, I want someone who's accountable, someone who's not a victim. And I mean that in the most positive, enlightened sense. So yeah, I still feel that anxiety. I still wish at times I could do what those folks do. But I also realize, you know what? They're not smarter than me. I'm not dumber than them. We're just wired differently. You know, the money for this going to the International Dyslexia Association. I, I know Joe Biden has talked about the fact when he interacts with a stutterer, yeah. uh, he often, those are relationships he keeps for years and it's changed so many of those kids' lives. For you, now out on the road, talking to kids that are dyslexic, what is that experience like for you and what is the message you hope that they get from this? It's, it's not something, you know, you wanna share to clean politicians, you expect a book about, here's my future for California and America, right? I mean, some power. We'll book. get that. Yeah, well, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But I was with kids yesterday and they all had dyslexia. They all learning dyslexia. When they walked in, I literally started crying. I like literally turned away from the guys talking to and I had to walk to get water. I started crying. I was triggered. That was me. How I feel? That's me, man. That's hard. I know what those kids are going through. I know how hard it is for them. They're giving up on themselves. By the way, it was a school that was for dropouts, kids from all the other schools. <laughs> and yet, I also, it was such a great opportunity to connect with them and talk about the fact that they could just, if they don't give up on themselves, they're gonna experience joy outside of the classroom. 
and strengths outside the castle that are exactly what we need in this world. Anyway, so it's a gift. I feel empowered. I feel resolved. This is a, a sweet spot for me because it's, it hits my heart, not my head. Uh, and, and it's just, it's a really, I think, when you talk about one in 20, I mean, one of five people, 20% of Americans, it's not a small number. And mm -hmm. it's something, con and it's their families that are impacted, it's society more Your broadly. Your own kids? My own kids, and it's the parents struggling that may not have it themselves. I just think it's important to start talking about these things in a way where we can destigmatize. Up next, we push the governor on surging crime in California and COVID. When could that state of emergency end? Stay with us. You're watching The Issue Is. My son cannot be comfortable in his own neighborhood. This week, Monica Boyd told us that she fears for her son's life in South Los Angeles, and she's not alone. This week, I asked Governor Newsom about crime while he was promoting his children's book at an elementary school. Crime. Yep. Uh, you look at the images, you know people right now are feeling unsafe, That's right. right? And they see those images and they wonder what's going on. And, and you know California history, we had uh, perhaps over-incarceration yep. after the 90s. Supreme Court says, get people out of jail. Have we gone too far the other way? Yeah. Uh, people are wondering, are our policies wrong? Yeah. What do you say? Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, but I think the point you just made is the right point. We feel unsafe. So all the facts and figures that I will provide in a second mean nothing to that feeling of anxiety. So yeah, you gotta call it out. The crime that we're seeing, the organized retail thefts, the flash mobs, that is unacceptable. People need to be held to account. Uh, you cannot soften this. We need to be tough. We need to be aggressive. We need to prosecute, period, full stop. It's unacceptable. I know that California is putting historic resources in this space. We weren't tired, timid. You were with me last July. We were with 13 big city mayors announcing the retail theft task force. We are trying to put a lid on this and stay on top of this. And you ain't seen nothing yet. Look at the budget that I'll come out with in the next few weeks in this space to double down on it. That said, here's some facts. 39 states, not California, 39 states since 2000 have reformed their felony status. We actually are, have 31 other states that have the exact same felony status that we raised that California has. Places like Texas have higher property crime rates, larceny rates, and violent crime rates. Our violent crime rate in California went up at a lower rate, 0.8%, than the national rate of 5%. Those are facts. The homicide rates in Montana, a red state, went through the roof, South Dakota, Kentucky, compared to California. That said, it's unacceptable what's happening here. In 2014, everyone's pointing to Prop 47. If Prop 47 is responsible for flash mobs stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars, if that's the case, then I ask, was it responsible for property crime and shoplifting, property crime and violent crime dropping in 2015 and 16 and 17 and 18 and 19. Mm. And I believe that it's difficult to assess either at this point. And we are experiencing something that's not unique. I mean, Minnesota, not just in Chicago, right. but also in other parts of the country. And so we have to get under the hood, but I think it's too easy to scapegoat those laws. But, but what about societally? Because I, I, we were together in the days after George Floyd was killed. We saw a lot of riots in the streets of Southern California, Northern California. And what's going on where people feel like this is okay? What's happened to our society where people are going out and doing this? Well, what didn't happen last year? People didn't have access to the classroom, after school programs, summer school programs, uh, mentoring, didn't have the alternative uh, strategies where you can get some relief mentally, physically. Uh, we all had to deal with isolation and anxiety because of a global pandemic. I don't care where you were in this country. I mean, stay-at-home orders aside, there was deep fear and anxiety. So society was foundationally disrupted at its core. You add that to social unrest and that anxiety manifesting differently, people's anonymity with masks, all of these things, sort of this sort of, all these tectonic pieces coming together. I, again, it's too early to assess because we don't have hindsight and we don't have the intellectual knowledge. But red states are experiencing not just blue states. You know the murder capital in California is? Kern County. Hmm. Republican DA, Republican sheriff, Reddest Republican, come on, yeah. I mean, it's, so it's a, we get a little, it's, it's a little too easy to fall prey, but feelings are real. And what we see with our own eyes is unacceptable. And this crime has to end. Another big topic, of course, is COVID. Uh, 
Big milestone, California now at 93% of people have at least one shot, which is something to celebrate, right? Yeah. But then when we get to that point, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? When does this state of emergency end uh, if we are seeing that much progress on vaccination? We know it when we experience it. Right. I mean, they say about success, it's not a place or a definition, it's a direction. I mean, eventually we'll get to that point, but it doesn't seem that there's a numerical match to it. It was, you know, initially a 60 percent and 70 percent. You had that with herd immunity antibodies for right. people that haven't been vaccinated. And now we're realizing, wait a second. I mean, there were many parts, one body. What happens in South Africa can impact us here in the United States. So even if a state does well, uh, that doesn't mean uh, we're out of the woods. Look, uh, we're making progress. California is about a third of the hospitalizations we were this time last year, less than a third of the average daily case rates than we did this time last year. That's because of our higher vaccination rates. We know this still overwhelmingly is a disease that is impacting disproportionately in ICUs and in terms of tragic death and loss of life, those that are unvaccinated. We're also starting to realize the power and potency of that third shot. And I think that's a consciousness we're starting to realize this was not just a two dose regime. It might require a three dose regime. And that's why we have to get these booster shot numbers up. So are you looking at fully vaccinated now being three shots? I know people have asked that. We're, there's nothing on the table on that yeah. at all, but it's pretty clear on the basis of all the studies that are coming out almost in real time every couple of days, not just what the CEO of Pfizer says. I always take CEOs of pharma uh, at face value, but the studies are coming around the world. Uh, that waning immunity is pretty profound and pronounced. That booster provides tremendous protection. 6.7, almost 6.8 million people have gotten their booster shot. So we're making some progress there. A lot more work to do. Uh, look, uh, we're not out of the woods, but we are faring extraordinarily well fourth lowest positivity rate in the country. That's remarkable for a state this size right. that experienced the winter surge last year. We're starting to see some increases, 22 states, big increases. This winter is going to challenge us. Let's be safe. As we go to break, props to our stage manager slash elf, Matt, for our beautiful holiday decorations here. And speaking of beautiful holiday decorations, check this out. Homemade neon lights display. The homeowner there made all this by hand. This is in Westchester. More of the issue is when we come back. Holidays almost here. Yeah. Um, what is the, the Newsom family holiday tradition? What is holidays at the Newsom house? I'll tell you what the biggest tradition is. Not being able to figure out, because there's six of us, what our holiday cards should look like. Hmm. We still haven't gotten it out. I've now realized this happens every single year. The worst part, the kids get older, older, they used to never approve the holiday card. Now they're like, no, I don't like that one. The <laughs> worst thing we did is allow Dutch, my five-year-old, to decide, and then he just, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so that's one tradition. I mean, is there a favorite movie or song or no, have, thing that you guys I all have, do? I have, I'm an old school, I still have uh, CDs, all five are Sinatra. Uh, holiday songs and the kids go crazy. They are so upset with me. They're like, not again, dad. Yet they have every single Sinatra holiday yeah. song. Right, so that's a tradition. And then the second tradition uh, is turkey uh, and getting everybody to do their part with stuffing and mashed potatoes. And we have a contest who did the best part. I always lose because I always overcook the turkey. We bring a couple uh, of family members over, but we keep it because the, the, I got four kids now. Yeah. We kind of keep it uh, uh, in-house and then we try to wake up uh, after 5 a.m., which is not easy because the kids uh, just aren't paying attention to the needs <laughs> of the parents. And just to wrap things up, it's been quite a year. Uh, we've experienced a lot of it together this year. Um, 2022 in California, what does that look like? I think uh, just I feel really optimistic about next year. I feel optimistic in terms of our capacity to get past the worst of this pandemic. I really believe that if we continue our boosters, we continue these vaccinations and we don't run the 90 yard dash. Uh, I have all the confidence that we'll do that. I think you've seen it the lowest, you saw the unemployment numbers today in terms of unemployment insurance, lowest in 52 years. I mean, there's a lot of really good signs out there, but you don't feel that when you watch TV, you feel horrible. I mean, it's just, it's like everybody needs it. I say with love and respect, those watching yeah. maybe right now, take a break this holiday, take a few days off from watching the networks and all the pundits and how terrible everything is. There's a lot of things to be proud of and a lot of things to be thankful for. And on the other side, California has abundance. 
and I'm claiming this now for the second year in a row, historic budget surpluses. We did a $12 billion tax cut. We're going to invest in crime and violence and invest in homelessness and address affordability and housing, public education reform. Get this pandemic behind us back to some semblance of normalcy. I do feel like we're turning the page. Forget politics. Our politics is going to be awful in 2022. Yes, it, will. <laughs> it will be awful. But that shouldn't define our lives. Our lives are so much bigger than the networks and the punditry. I hope we can disabuse ourselves that we have to be what some of the cable networks are telling us we are. I know you want to take a break from TV, but I know you never take a break from the issue is. So <laughs> never the issue. We, That's different. We, we appreciate that. Again, the book, Ben and Emma's Big Hit. Congratulations Thank on you. this. A great holiday gift. Happy holidays, the whole Newsom family. Thank you. Our thanks to Governor Newsom. The book is available in stores everywhere. In his honor, we're playing some old blue eyes, which is also one of my holiday favorites. Up next, the outsize role California and Californians played this week in our national Christmas lighting. But first, these images of the holiday celebration underway at Ghirardelli Square in San Francisco. Welcome back. Next week, a very special edition of The Issue Is. We are leaving the studio and taking our show on the road. We head to Calusa County for an in-depth sit-down with the longest-serving governor in California history. He'll weigh in on hot topics, talk about his legacy, and show us his way off the grid. Jerry Brown next week. But we end this week in Washington with the lighting of the National Christmas Tree. This is one of the only events that brought together Republicans and Democrats from our state. The tree itself is from California. The kid who lit it is from California, too. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Four, three, two, one, Michael.